From the editors of Biological Psychiatry and the Society of Biological Psychiatry, this is Biological Psychiatry Live. And I'm Dr. Tamara Gore, the social media editor. And I have with me today, Dr. Dina Walker. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Dr. Dina Walker. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Behavioral Neuroscience at Oregon Health and Science University. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today about your recent publication in our journal. Yeah, thanks for having me. If you could start by telling me what was previously known about how adolescent social isolation influences preferences for drugs of abuse in both males and then females. Yeah, so adolescent social isolation has been used as a preclinical model for susceptibility to uh, substance use disorder for a long time. Um, I would say at least 30 years. That is a and, long time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and generally speaking, uh, it's in males, it's been shown to increase preference for multiple drugs of abuse. Um, and in self admin paradigms, they usually see an increase, an increase in uh, acquisition of cocaine self-administration. Mm -hmm. Some of those are, you know, the results are always a little complicated to interpret when we're looking at it globally, but um, just sort of generally speaking, we see this sort of increase in susceptibility to susceptibility, uh, susceptibility to substance use disorder, mm -hmm. sort of across a number of paradigms that, that they've measured. Mm -hmm. um, in females, there's much less data. <laughs> uh, that's starting to change, uh, with, especially with the NIH uh, mandate, but um, I wrote a review on social isolation and the behavioral impacts in 2019 and i if i remember correctly i only had maybe three papers that had looked at females wow I, I should have gone back and like counted them up exactly but it wasn't a lot that's what i can tell you <laughs> um and i know of a few more that have come out recently and again they're you know we're still trying to piece together what it's doing in females a lot more than we are in males there's some evidence that it increases preference. There's some ev evidence that it doesn't affect preference for drugs of abuse at all, and, and um, some evidence that it decreases preference. So I think in those cases, we're going to have to do a lot more research to figure out what exactly it's doing to females. Mm -hmm. In addition to looking at, at females in your study, um, how else did your methodology address this gap in our understanding? So I think the biggest thing this study did was to uh, use RNA sequence analysis to um, take an unbiased approach uh, in what the transcriptomic changes are in response to adolescent stress and then in response to um, cocaine exposure in adulthood. Mm -hmm. So we, we had the animals go through social isolation stress. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we did that isn't often done um, is to rehouse them in late adolescence so that we could isolate specifically what the adolescent impact was um, versus a lot of the studies will start isolating right around weaning and then just keep them in isolation until they're adults or until they're tested behaviorally or, or whatever endpoint they're looking at. Um, but I was really interested in adolescence as a key period for reorganization of the reward circuitry. And so I, wa I didn't want the confound of the long-term isolation on um, the transcriptomic changes. Um, so you wanted just the critical window. Okay. Of, so sorry to interrupt. You wanted the critical window of adolescence. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I hate the word critical window. I already. Yeah, I, think, it, but, I think people yeah, so, always want to. Great. Yeah. So the 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 specific development window window of adolescence right. we were really interested in is there something specific to adolescence that's important for development of the reward circuitry that gets programmed. Um, at the level of the transcriptome that then is sort of reactivated or activated in a different way when we expose the animals to cocaine. And we gave two different dosing paradigms of cocaine. Mm -hmm. um, one is just the first dose of cocaine meant to sort of model this like recreational use or initial exposure to cocaine and how the reward circuitry might be different or altered by social isolation stress. And then we gave 10 injections of cocaine to sort of model like a more chronic exposure to cocaine and see how chronic exposures might influence the transcriptomic uh, 
programming of the reward circuitry as well. Great. And so now that you've laid out nicely for us what you did, is there new information? Uh, so oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> your study? No, I mean, let me ask you, let me yeah. set you up to hit it out of the park. What new information does your study suggest? Um, so, yeah, so the first thing we found um, was that isolation stress um, really alters the transcriptional response to cocaine, and that there are very sex specific responses in all three brain regions that we, we investigated, the nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental area, and the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. um, so in the control males and females, there was very little overlap of the genes that were regulated by cocaine. And when the animals had gone through social isolation, that even that overlap was gone. So there weren't the same genes that were regulated by social isolation. Um, the other thing we found was that when we looked at sex specific expression at baseline, so we compared our control males to our control females, mm -hmm. um, we saw sex specific expression that was also sort of, uh, was, I just, it was disrupted by social isolation. So we lost sex differences in expression and then we gained these sex differences in response to cocaine. Um, and then in trying to make sense of how those changes were occurring, we used a number of bioinformatic approaches to get an idea of first, um, is the loss of sex differences driven by um, SI males, the socially isolated males becoming more like females mm -hmm. in their transcriptomic uh, profile? Is it driven by socially isolated females becoming more like males in their transcript? transcriptomic structure, um, or is it that there's uh, specific transcripts that are regulated in SI males that aren't regulated in SI females and vice versa. So by doing that, we got a, we were able to sort of develop a really big picture of how um, social isolation first disrupts sex differences in transcription and then lays the patterning down for a really different transcriptional response to cocaine that could be underlying the sex differences that we are, you know, only beginning to understand in the behavioral phenotypes that we see. Mm -hmm. So, so which was, which was it? Was it the males looking more like females or somewhere in between? Sort of, <laughs> as with everything, it's so much more complicated, but of course. Uh, across the board, we saw SI males looking more like group house females. So looking more like the control females. Um, and what was interesting was as you layered on new stimuli mm -hmm. in adulthood. So when we looked at how chronic cocaine might be influencing the transcriptome, or when we looked at how the first dose of cocaine might be uh, altering the transcriptome, then we started to see that the SI females started to look more like the group house control males. Wow. So at baseline, you really didn't see the SI females showing much of a male typical pattern of expression, but as you layered on these other stimuli, it started to, these, these sort of masculinized uh, transcripts is what, how we refer to them in the paper, mm -hmm. um, start to emerge. So that suggests to us that maybe something about um, the female stress response might be getting sort of uh, might be more male typical during that adolescent because of that adolescent stressor. That's actually one of the things that I'm really interested in looking at mm -hmm. in the future is like how their how their stress response and then how other hormones during development might be changing in response to social isolation that could be like sort of driving these patterns that we're seeing. That sounds like it would be really important to understand that. Um, can I ask you? You know, I can't help but ask you, um, what would you infer, if I forced you to infer something, which I'm about to, about what might be happening right now to adolescents due to COVID-19, we know that there's a lot of isolation going on, um, in light of your findings. Yeah, so I get asked this question a lot. I'm, and not I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I think it's, I think it's really, really important. And in fact, um, I've been talking to um some researchers who do human work mm -hmm. to see if we can um 
human work in adolescence to see if we can see some of the same changes that we saw in our animal model mm -hmm. um, and maybe be able to infer what this isolation stress is doing to adolescents. Um, if we think that isolation stress um, is a good model of loneliness, mm -hmm. so that's one of the things that's a little bit up for debate. Um, yeah. I think, I think that adolescent social isolation could be a really great model for not only what's happening during COVID, but what's happening to adolescents because of social media, because of mm -hmm. smartphones, because so there, we, we're seeing increased rates of loneliness in adolescent kids um, right now. And it's, you know, only being exacerbated by COVID-19. So mm -hmm. um, what I would hope is that we can apply what we're seeing in our animal models to understand what might be happening in the developing brain. Mm -hmm. um, and look for specific interventions that might be um, indicative of what's, or like maybe important for uh, helping to alleviate some of these stressors on the brain. Like, and and the other, oh sorry, the other thing that I just think is like one of the strengths of the study that um, shouldn't be overlooked is that because isolation stress disrupts sex specific transcription and because it disrupts um, sex specific responses to drugs of abuse. Mm -hmm. We can use this model now to try to understand not just uh, sex specific responses to cocaine, but um, or sex dependent, but we can also look at sex independent. So we kind of see this flipping of the male female transcriptome, and we see this flipping of some of the. Uh, this paper is not yet, but we're writing up a paper. Um, that's on that's a preprints out where we see a flipping of the behaviors, the behavioral phenotypes. Oh, interesting. So, so what we can do now is say we have a male group that's susceptible and a female group that's susceptible, and we have the opposite. So we can look at both sex dependent and sex independent drivers of some of these behavioral phenotypes. And that's really one of the strengths of the model is to try to understand how much of this is really a biological variable of sex and then how much of it is um, something that we can understand in a, in a sex independent way. Mm -hmm. It seems like you've gained a lot of um, information that will help you ask better questions and more specific and move in more specific directions. So that's very exciting. Yeah, I think we're just at the beginning of this. So that's what's uh, uh, when I first started this study, like <laughs> you would have told me that we would have seen a disruption of sex specific transcription or behaviors or anything, I would have, I probably wouldn't have believed you. Um, <laughs> I had studied sex differences for quite a while and I, I had focused mostly on like, the early critical window of sexual differentiation of the brain in rodents. And- No wonder you grimaced when I used the word critical window, yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, good point. Um, and so I just wasn't expecting to see such prolonged sex specific effects yeah. um, from an adolescent stressor. And so that was, that's what I mean by we're at the beginning of something. I think um, this model could be really powerful in understanding a lot of, of regulation of sex specific uh, transcription, but also how that changes the developmental trajectory of different circuitry in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, and then how does that lead to differences in behavioral phenotypes that are important for, you know, sex specific behaviors. So it sounds like you're delineating like a career's worth work of work. So I think it's an <laughs> exciting, exciting thing to be sitting on. So congratulations and thank you again for taking yeah. time to talk to me today. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was great. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks.